Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. What do you get when you combine bugs, weeds, and lots of shrubs? It's the Q&A show just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. It's getting to be summer and the gardens are in and growing. Over the past few months, we've answered some viewer questions that we have not had time to air. So we're catching up. Let's start with a question about pill bugs. We have been growing our veggies for years. The last five years, we've been fighting the roly-polies or pill bug. These bugs have been wiping out our veggies. We thought they were supposed to be great in the garden, but we have generations of them. How do we control pill bugs? We have tried everything, and this is Debbie from Las Vegas, Nevada. So are you familiar with the roly-polies? Oh, yes, I used to torment them when I was a little <laughs> kid. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those as a kid as well. Yeah. If you know anything about roly-polies or the pill bugs, first of all, they're actually related to lobsters. You know, I actually found it out, you know, years oh, ago. Wow. I think that's pretty, yeah, pretty <laughs> unique. Um, but they love moist conditions. Yeah, that's it. I, you find them under bricks. Right, so you find them under bricks, any debris that you have in the garden. But again, they need moist conditions to, mm -hmm. to survive. Of course, they're feeding on decaying organic matter or material, right? So when you think about that, Mr. John, they're actually beneficial because they're doing nutrient recycling, right? But the thing is, if there's no decaying organic matter ah, there, there they go. will feed on mm -hmm. little seedlings. You know, which could be a problem. So we need to provide them with a better diet of uh, decaying organic material. So if you get them decaying organic material, mm -hmm. uh, that will definitely help. But here's something else too that you have to think, think about, right? So we're talking about moist conditions. Culturally, maybe you have, you know, bad drainage or something mm -hmm. there. Something, yeah, that you know, maybe, you know, collecting a lot of, you know, um, moisture maybe. Uh, you know, something else, you know, that I would think about, you know, as well is, practice good sanitation, right? So you have yeah, to clean course. up your garden mm -hmm. because that's what they're trying to overwinter is where you have that old crop residue. Sure. So if you practice good sanitation, get rid of that crop residue, I think that may help. Now, I know some people that may try diatomaceous earth. I mean, you can try that, mm -hmm. it may help, you know, for a little while. I actually know somebody who would uh, sink uh, like a coffee can lid or a jar lid in the soil and fill it full of beer. Oh, I've heard about that for right. slugs. That actually works for, you know, roly-polies as uh -huh. well, pill bugs. You know, of course, they'll fall in and they'll drown. You know, that way they're attracted to the yeast, okay? Uh, something else that you could use, you have to be careful when you read and follow the label, slug snail bait. Mm -hmm. So any bait that contains iron phosphate, uh, which is a lot safer, uh, you can use that as well if you have to. Mm -hmm. But I would practice good sanitation. Right. You know, I like cultural practices. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Extreme moist conditions, yeah, you need to yeah, kind of straighten it up a little bit, right? Uh, and then from there, I think you should be okay. Mm -hmm. I think it'll yeah, be fine. I think so. Yeah, but again, they are beneficial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nutrient recycling is what they're doing. What is the best way to deter snakes in the garden? I sure don't want to find one while I'm working, and this is Mary, right here in Cordova. So, yeah, we get that question a lot at the extension office as well. So mm -hmm. how do you deter those snakes from uh, being in the garden? Well, you know, if you're finding snakes, okay. well, if you're finding <laughs> snakes in your garden while you're tilling things up, snakes okay. that are in there, those are typically going to be smaller snakes that are um, beneficial to your soil. They're eating things like earthworms. Okay. So if you've got earthworms, then you're doing something right. If okay. you've got enough Good. that you're attracting predators, right. you've got some great soil, right? right. So those guys, I, they're really small. So things like worm snakes, smooth earth snakes, small snakes hanging out um, in that area. Okay. Um, not a bad thing. Not a bad and thing. And right. they are way more afraid of us. They see us as predators. Okay. If you're attracting the larger snakes, those snakes are typically going after rodents. And so, again, food source, if you can eliminate right. the food source, you're going to prevent them from coming in there. 
But the little ones in your garden, um, they look like worms. Just say they're worms and move on. <laughs> Just say they're worms and move on. All right. So w what about those big snakes? So can you give us some examples of some of the big snakes we might see in oh, the garden? Oh, sure. So Is rat snakes. Okay. Okay. The name huh. kind of gives away what yeah. they're going after. Yeah. Um, king snakes. King snakes are great to have around. I always say, if this is not going to make sense okay. at first, yeah, okay. if right. you don't like snakes, you want to have a king snake around. Okay. So the king snakes actually eat other snakes. How about that? Including venomous snakes. So it is a non venomous snake, but they will eat other snakes. Okay. And they will keep other snakes out of the area. How so about that? Um, if you see a king snake and you're not a big fan of snakes, make sure you keep the king snakes around. How about that? Yeah. yeah, so do your research and so you can know what those uh, king snakes look like, be able to identify them. So having a king snake is actually good. It is. Expect, yeah, they'll keep the other snakes away. How on earth can I kill off English ivy and other such invasive vines? It started in the yard of a neighbor two doors away and they shared it with the rest <laughs> of the neighborhood. Of course, now they have moved away. And this is Tom from Ellesmere, Kentucky. <laughs> so. That's a good question. Yeah, I like that that's one. So one. how do you kill off this English ivy that's been shared with the, you know, the neighborhood, so to speak? Um, so how, yeah, how do we control Well, that? you know what? Ivy is, is one of those <laughs> top invasive species yeah. in the United States. So yes, I can see why they want to get rid of it. And yeah. definitely once yeah. it starts going up a tree, it gets in the top yeah. of the tree, it gets even worse because then it produces berries that the birds spread everywhere and it, then it just gets to be bad. That's why it's an invasive species. It's very invasive. So, uh, it's, incidentally enough, I'm surprised that it hasn't taken a hit because we have one small bed of it and they were hit by this cold weather we had mm -hmm. this last year. It slowed and it up pretty slowed good. slowed it up mm -hmm. quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, that should help him out this year a little bit. Yeah. Um, but just again, remember, there's a rhizoma system of underground of all of these uh, roots and, and rhizomes of the ivy. And until you get rid of all of it, you are going to have it keep coming up. So either pulling, cutting, herbicide spray on it. Yeah. Whatever you want yeah. to do to get rid of it, that's how you're going to. And if it's growing up a tree, I say cut it off at the base and try to get it off the tree. Yeah. But if it's too far up in the tree, it may already be into the bark system and then you're only going to hurt it. It may still live up in the tree. I don't know. Yeah, English ivy is so tough. It's, but yeah, it is. You're right. So you can try to mow it. Mm -hmm. You can get the weed eater out and see if that will help. Uh, once it starts to regrow, spring is the best time to do this. I would have probably apply two to three percent, you know, product that contains glyphosate. You yes. need to follow the label. Uh, because if you catch it young, right, it doesn't have the waxy cuticle. Right, and right? it will, it, it will, it will absorb it. Right, yeah. it will absorb and, and translocate, you know, that way. So 2 to 3% solution, glyphosate product, or you can go with a 2 to 5% solution of triclopyr. We didn't follow the label on that. But yeah, catch it early. Yeah, <laughs> and, you, and you have to keep up with it. You got to keep it. You got to keep going. Because as soon as you think you've got it all and it starts coming back again, you've got to get it before it starts maturing those yeah. leaves out so it doesn't get that waxy. Yeah. Uh, coating on it. Yeah, got to keep up with it. So, Mr. Tom. That's quite a chore. Yeah, you're going to be pretty busy. Everybody's <laughs> going to be busy. You're going to be busy. But, you know, once everybody gets rid of it, then they won't have yeah. it in their neighborhood anymore. That's right. So, yeah. And won't it won't it. be an invasive species right. in that neighborhood. <laughs> they won't have it to share it. No. Mr. Tom said. When you say to avoid privet, what kind do you mean and why? I recently planted some Recova folium or recurve privet for privacy in Southeast Tennessee. This is Tara on YouTube. So Tara, we have somebody here who knows a little bit about privet, right? At right. Lincoln Nature Center. Right. So Mary, what do you think about that? That's the privet we're talking about yeah. to avoid. That is the Chinese privet. Yeah. It's just a, um, a variety of the Chinese right. privet, the recurved one. Yep. Um, the reason we talk about avoiding it, it is a non-native mm -hmm. invasive plant. Mm -hmm. It grows a little crazy. <laughs> oh. um, if your yeah. neighbor has it, it's going to start <laughs> popping up in your yard. Right. It's prone to white flies mm -hmm. and some other um, That's diseases. Good. That's good. Um, so, of course, what I'm going to say is get rid of the privet yeah. and look for a native alternative. Look for a native alternative. Yeah, because the thing about a privet, 
real extensive root system. Yes. Right. I would get rid of it as soon as possible. If she just planted it, um, hopefully it hasn't rooted or established. Yeah. So I, I would get rid of it because you're going to be fighting it for a long time if you have it. Yeah, and the thing about that, it produces a fruit. Mm -hmm. And of course the wildlife you know, likes the fruit. And then spreads it. And spreads it, mm -hmm. right. So Chinese privet, oh, Ligustrum sinensis, very invasive, mm -hmm. yeah. Dense, you know, stand, you know, shrubs it can produce. Crowds yes. out the spring ephemerals, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I would look for some alternatives. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, do some research, uh, go to your local extension office and look for some alternatives. Yeah, some native alternatives yeah. in her region in, in Southeast yeah. Tennessee. Um, inkberry. Oh, there you go. It's an evergreen shrub. Okay. Um, you could do some of the native hydrangeas. Okay. They're going to lose some of their leaves in the winter, but, um, and beautyberry yeah, is another one. one. Um, right. And that one you can kind of prune to be what you want like it. it to be as well. So avoid the privet if you can. All right, Tara. Yeah, avoid it if you can. There are some alternatives there, native alternatives. Yeah, stop by your local extension office. They will have more for you as well. We have several wild holly trees with nice red berries for the birds. Also, we have one holly with only some small white flowers on it. Why have we never seen any berries on this holly? This is Joan and Dan on YouTube. So oh. berries are one, mm -hmm. just white flowers on the other. Yes. Why is that, we think? Well, because one's male and one's female. That's right. Uh, the yep. females are the ones with the red berries. The male's the one that has the flowers that didn't you know, and there's like, everybody thinks, well, flowers, yeah. and it doesn't have berries, it doesn't make sense. But think about squash. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Squash has male flowers and female flowers. Mm -hmm. that's good and that's why we get a lot of questions sometimes saying, my squash is blooming, but I'm not getting any yeah. uh, squash from it. Well, what's probably blooming is the male flowers. Yeah, first, yeah. First, so, yeah, that, so it, it's true of the whole plant world. All right. Um, so there's male and female. So I would assume the one that doesn't get berries is the male. It's the male. Yeah. There's a term that comes to mind, dioecious. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Female and male flowers it's on separate plants. On separate plants. All right. One right. of the first words I, I learned in botany. Right. How about that? Yeah, dioecious. Uh-huh. So yeah, so that's why you see the red berries on one, female, mm -hmm. no berries on the other one. The male. The male. I have five camellias that are over 10 years old. All have grown beautifully, but one puts out buds about one inch long and maybe one half inch diameter. And then the buds easily fall off the tree. Every year I treat all five the same way, water and identical fertilizer. This year, the little brown buds hang on through the blooming season, but still no blooms. It's even the same height and width as its fellow camellias. What can I do to help this one camellia to actually bloom? Thanks for your help. This is Cheryl from Clover, South Carolina. So wow. it's just that one. Just that one. It's the one out of the five. Yeah. Um, but it's not blooming. So what do you think? What comes to mind? Well, she's, it is getting blooms, but they're yeah. dropping off. They're just dropping off the buds, right? One thing that's real critical is early spring and late summer, the camellias do not like to be dry. Mm, so you mm. gotta make sure that mm. time of year, and that is the time of year that causes them to possibly drop their buds. Okay. okay. So those are two critical times that she needs to make sure there's enough water on them. Now, we don't know if they're under irrigation, we don't know yeah. how she's watering them. Um, how much water she's How much on water she's yeah. putting on them. But because she, the others are doing fine, this, screams to me of the same example of, oh, I have a plant, the same plant on either side of my front door, <laughs> right. but one side doesn't look good that the other one does, and there's not that far apart. It, it, there's some kind of environmental condition that is causing that particular one to have problems versus the others. Right. And the only thing that I can think of is, because it, it talks about needing water at those two times of the year, well, is there a tree or is there something else See, that is sucking the water away that's from that particular plant yeah. more so than the others? Yeah. But there's a, there's a Clemson University um, like publication on, on mm -hmm. care and you know we can put that on the website too. Right. Uh, but those are, the, those are the little things that I could think of that I found that can cause bud drop. 
Okay. And because there's a flower blight, but they have to they bloom they first. Flower. Right. They and flower. they don't they're not blooming. Right. They're dropping off. And they need water, those two critical points, early spring, late summer. And just I would say maybe this year try to water them more than the others. Okay. Water and that see one. if that yeah, works. That particular one. Mm -hmm. Even watering. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And two, I, I, again, I wonder how much water you know, she's mm -hmm. putting out. Okay. How do I care for these two starter plants? And this is Michelle from Memphis, Tennessee. First plant is Calancho, right? Mm -hmm. The thing about Calancho is going to be this, Mr. John. So it loves bright indoor light. Ah, the problem with house plants. Yeah, that's the light. Yeah, right? it's, it's always a problem. Uh, just houses, by and large, don't have as much light as mm -hmm. plants would like. That's right. So bright indoor light, mm -hmm. you can give it that good, well-drained potty mix, right? Mm -hmm. A potty medium. You definitely need that, okay? Something else about house plants, you probably know this, it's the watering regime, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want to be soggy, right? They actually want to dry out before you water them. Mm -hmm. So I will let, you know, those plants dry out before I water. Mm -hmm. And then if you need to fertilize, I'll probably fertilize Calancho maybe once a month uh, with one of your liquid you know, houseplant fertilizers, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, Calancho is pretty easy you know, to maintain. So bright indoor light, you should be fine with that. Now the other plant was peace lily. Seems like everybody has a peace lily, right? Yes. All right, a pretty you know, popular mm -hmm. uh, you know, house plant. And they're a little more forgiving of a, a, a darker room, too. Right, they can actually uh, flower in low light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my mom has a house full of uh, peace lilies, so low light, they can flower, but they do like bright indirect sunlight. Mm -hmm. And the thing about peace lilies is gonna be this, right? So you have to have a moist soil, not soggy, but moist. So let it dry out just a little mm -hmm. bit in between waterings, and then, of course, water you know, appropriately at that time. Yeah, and I would think of uh, that giving them a bigger pot yes. would be a good thing too. Yes, yeah, bigger pots, you know, definitely for both of these plants, mm -hmm. especially for the peace lily. Actually likes to be kind of root bound a little bit, but when the roots start coming out of the, you know, the mm -hmm. bottom holes, and make sure right. you have drainage holes, mm -hmm. uh, that's very oh, yes. important. Uh, then you might need to go up another pot size, but your yeah, draining holes are gonna be real important. Yeah, don't let them just sit, you know, let that water sit in those saucers, mm -hmm. right? And let the pot sit in there, you know, with that, uh, because yeah, that can cause problems. Uh, but light is going to be key. It's going to be key, Miss Michelle. So Absolutely. again, for your calancho, bright indoor light. And then for your peace lily, yeah, it can flower in low light, but it likes bright indirect yes. light. And then watch your watering. Let, those, uh, let the soil dry out a little bit before you do water, and I think you'll be fine. I purchased a lemon Meyer a few months ago. I transplanted it recently, and the roots were extremely wet. How can I make sure the roots get the right amount of moisture and how often is recommended to water? I was doing it only if the soil looked almost dry, but apparently that didn't work. And this is Delia from Lakewood, Colorado. So yeah, yeah we looked at that picture. Yeah, that picture. Uh, wow. Uh, now, she said that it was wet when she got it. Yeah. And, and that I can understand that with okay. shipping, you know, because they didn't know how long it would take to get there. And so they wanted to make sure it had plenty of water. Um, she potted it. I know she potted it in a big container because she knew it was going to get large. Right. I would tend to want to put it in a smaller container mm. because then it will drain out and dry out a little faster. In that large container, there's no roots. The roots haven't gotten into that right. container. Okay. So it's staying doing. wetter longer. Ah. And she, in the, the top might dry out, but underneath might is not. Right, I got you. Okay. And so I never go by the looks. I always touch the soil. And in fact, I'll dig down an inch or so. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's usually when a, a plant is in the container that it's almost the size of. She says she put it in such a large container, that's where I think the problem is that she's, mm. it's too wet and she's thinking it's dry and it's really not because it's so vast amount of area of soil that is wetted that there's no roots in to take up the moisture. So it's it. staying wetter down in the soil okay. than she thinks it is. But a moisture meter, I mean, she yeah, could get a moisture meter, meter right. and figure that out. But yeah, it's not got enough light versus the wetness of the soil to be able to... Mm. Uh, 
you know, thrive. Okay. Right now. Right now. Yeah, because it was a pretty good yeah, size. Yeah, I, I would put it in. A, if you get, if you do that again, I would put it in a smaller container so you can really monitor uh, how that pot is actually drying out versus this huge amount of soil right. from a little tiny plant. Okay. Yeah. Make sure you have some well-drained media. You yes. Know, potty media for sure. Uh, yeah. Not soggy. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, Moist. It's, it looks right. like it's And don't separate. let it completely dry out. No, no Not no. completely dry out. Uh, but uh, yeah, so much. But drier. Air. Yeah, mm -hmm. but drier. So I am a home gardener with two peach trees. Last July, I noticed some sap on one of my trees. The sap seems to only be coming from two or three spots and not the whole trunk. I'm wondering if this is normal or if it is caused by the peach borer or some other insect. How can I manage it for the upcoming season? I did read about the chemicals you mentioned, but am not sure about timing since I'm in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Also, if it is insect damage, can my tree be saved or will it die? And thank you much. And this is Punnett from Chicago. Mm -hmm. So a pretty detailed question yeah. there. I appreciate that. So what do you think? So she's correct. How do you manage it? Well, she's correct. Yeah, I think yeah. it is the peach tree. Borer. I think it's the lesser peach tree borer. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And and timing. She's she's oh, good man. to want to know about the timing of the mm -hmm. sprays. And uh, there's a publication from Purdue University, okay. which is pretty close to her, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that does have a a guide for the Midwest. Okay. So. Um, if you might want to look at that, well, I guess we'll have that on our website too. Yeah, we can have that information there. Uh, sure. But yeah, and keep it healthy. Gosh, try to keep you it healthy. Keep it, yeah, keep it water for sure. You know, fertilizer you know may help as well. Uh, but time is going to be critical. Uh, gummosis is what we're seeing there. Mm -hmm. So anytime you have that sap that's mixed actually with frass, mm -hmm. right, and a little sawdust, yeah, yeah, that might be the lesser peach tree bore. Right, so you have to look at that. Um, I would target that though in July, in the summer, June, July. With an insecticide? With an insecticide, it's, and it's gonna be a preventative insecticide, so it's gonna be, so one that comes to mind is, uh, you know, permethrin, you know, mm -hmm. you can use, you have to read and follow the label on that. The publication might have the information as well. Mm -hmm. Carbaryl, you know, mm -hmm. is another one. Yeah. Uh, but again, so when the moth comes and lays the egg, the egg's gonna hatch and the larva's gonna try to get into that wood. That's why I would say July would be a good time for that because that's usually when the moth is, you know, on active. her yeah, flight. Yeah. Right, pretty active. Well, and yeah. then you're gonna, it's not just one time she's gonna spray. Ah. She's gonna have to yeah. keep spraying every like two weeks, whatever right. the label says for the insecticide she uses is how long it will last. Yeah. And of course, if it rains, all bets are off. You gotta oh, spray that's right. over, that's over again. That's a good point, darling. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so do read and follow the label. But it is savable. It is savable. Yeah, keep it comfortable. It is savable. Uh, you should be fine. You should be fine. Tree, yeah, peach trees. I'm thinking about Mr. D now. Boy, they're tough, All right? Yeah. They're tough. How do I get rid of mole crickets? They are destroying my lawn. My pesticide company has not helped. <laughs> and this is Bridget. So, uh, yeah, we had a little conversation about mole crickets. Pretty yeah. interesting uh, little critters, right? They, they are. Yeah. yeah, and definitely attracted to the turf grasses. Yeah, so they love the turf grasses, mm -hmm. uh, which is why, you know, we always tell folks, you know, make sure you grow a thick, healthy stand of grass. Make sure you're cutting at the appropriate height, mm -hmm. fertilizing according to your soil test and then irrigating properly as well, uh, because they do like your uh, turf grasses, especially if they're weakened, yes. right, by scalping your lawn and things like that, because they tunnel mm -hmm. uh, in the soil. They can eat roots, shoots, and they can eat your leaves, right? But the interesting thing about mole crickets, well, it's gonna be the life cycle, right? So they're pretty active a couple of times during the year. So in the fall of the year, the adults will start laying eggs, all right? So you can actually target you know, the adults because they're laying the eggs in the fall, but in the spring, they're very active. The little nymphs are out there, so you definitely want to target those nymphs. Mm -hmm. Now, your pesticide companies will probably have products uh, that you can use. Bifenthrin is one that comes to mind. Uh, permethrin is another one. Mm -hmm. There are some soil systemic drenches uh, that you can use as well, but you will have to talk to your pesticide company right. you know, about that. Okay? But we also learned something else interesting that could help out. Yeah. So. Um, we were kind of looking into it and there is a parasitic wasp mm -hmm. that um, parasitizes the mole crickets. Right. So basically they lay their eggs on them and then as the young wasp develops, it's eating and eventually killing that cricket. Right. 
So, so there's actually a way to attract that wasp okay. to your area. <laughs> now, I should say this is not a wasp that is going to sting you. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they're small. They're not the typical wasp that we're thinking right. of. Right. That's um, good. Yeah. So there is a native plant, and um, I can't remember where Bridget is from, but uh, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, she didn't tell us. But it sh it should be there's one called partridge pea. Okay. And apparently these wasps really like that plant. So if you plant that, you can have, you can potentially attract that wasp um, to help deal with your mole crickets. Okay. The other one is, and we were talking the extension office in Florida is working, looking at uh, nematodes. Mm -hmm. um, so nematodes are microscopic parasitic worms. Right. And they target, well, this specific type is targeting mole crickets. Indeed. So a little bit of new stuff coming out. Yeah, new stuff coming out, which is why it's always good to uh, consult with your local extension office. That's right. Right, because they have that information there for you, research-based information. Mm -hmm. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for sending in the questions. They keep us on our toes. To get more information on anything we talked about today or to see answers to even more questions, go to familyplotgarden.com. And while you're there, you can ask us your gardening questions. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.